Hey everyone, my name is Andres Pimentel. Today is the first of a couple of videos on being non-binary and fashion and gender. Today I'm with my friend Juanik and we're going to talk about gender, fashion, history. Hi everyone, I'm Juanik, oh, Juanik Nazilbot. I prefer my nickname Juanik. I'm 22 years old. I'm going to talk about some definitions about gender and clothing. Gender expression is a person's outward gender presentation usually comprised of personal style. It's how someone communicates their gender through clothing, hairstyle, makeup, jewelry, body language, behavior, and other aspects of outwardly displaying gender. Gender expression is typically categorized as feminine or masculine, less commonly as androgynous. All people express a gender. Uh, gender expression can and cannot be congruent with a person's gender identity. Now, Gender identity uh, is a person's inner sense of being a woman, man, another gender, or having no gender at all. Gender identity does not necessarily align in a traditional sense with the sex a person is assigned at birth, typically female or male. Gender identity might also change over time for some people. Speaking of differentiating genders with clothing, nowadays we speak of clothing with gender by pattern. The flat drawing in the fabric with cuts and seams that accommodate the common body of a man or woman, uh, so this clothing adapts to a body due to its physical differences. The clothes with gender according to society. This differentiation is very familiar to us in the collective imagination. Society and the individual is what gives a specific color or a piece of clothing uh, a gender. And clothed without gender. That aims to eliminate the barriers and labels that differentiate between women and men's clothing. The genderless goes beyond the clothing traditionally known as unisex, but marks a trend for the change of thought and conception of gender than we had before. The agender movement is committed to a fashion that defends the identity and individual style of each one regardless of their gender. Historically, skirts and dresses were unisex, practical from cavemen to Egyptians to Greeks. Later, Roman warriors and centurions would wear short leather skirts that would certainly raise eyebrows if worn by men in public today. Even in medieval art, for example, clothing very similar to skirts and dresses can be seen. The 1500s have some of the most ornate clothing. Even into the 1700s, there was a care for fashion in men. Uh, Louis XIV would be an example. It's really in the middle of the 20th century that it was decided that this was no longer the norm. There are some fantastic exceptions, like Jean-Paul Gaultier, 1958's fashionable skirt. More modernly, there are influencers like Harrison O'Farrell, George Ahn, Sean Altman, Jaden Smith, Kylan Zoldale, sorry, I'm butchering that probably, Ezra Miller, uh, The Harper Waters, Little Naz, X, Billy Porter, and the band Maniskin. These people break barriers that were broken by humans ages ago and throughout time. Heels. As a piece of specific groups of different societies, in the butcher's shoes in ancient Egypt or India, the so-called kotorni in, of theater actors in ancient Greece, and the shoes that differentiated sex slaves in Rome. But it was not a fashionable garment among the majority. That began thanks to a Middle East empire. The origin of high-heeled shoes dates back to the 15th and 16th century so that Persian soldiers could hold on to their horses. Later, these military elements were adopted in Europe. The men wanted to look as manly as the horse riders from Persia, and it became an element of power and lineage for the rich men of the time. Its popularity grew and the higher the hill, the greater your purchasing power and virility. But Louis XIV uh, took hills to new levels of popularity between the nobles and other figures of power such as uh, Queen Elizabeth I who ordered them to look more manly. When more women wore heels in the 18th century, the thinking of the time was not to wear impractical clothing, at least not men. <laughs> the biggest change comes by the 19th century post-war decades when heels became way more related to women's sexualized clothing than men's common clothes. Hombres y mujeres han usado maquillaje por siglos. Hoy en día cada vez es más y más aceptado. Con celebridades como Batman Rock, que hizo la portada de Playboy, y cientos de videos de hombres mostrando cómo usar maquillaje en YouTube, cada vez es más y más común. Incluso hay marcas que apoyan este surgimiento. Empresas como Givenchy Mister, ha existido por varios años, 
más recientemente Pleasing de Harry Styles, cómo han cambiado los tiempos de los egipcios. Para mí el maquillaje es como la ropa o las prendas, si te hace sentir bien, úsalo, si no, no. Pero ahora aprendemos un poco más de la historia, porque la verdad no es tan simple como maquillaje siempre ha sido para mujeres y andar sin maquillaje siempre ha sido para hombres. Cosmetics were an inherent part of Egyptian hygiene and health. Uh, European men and women often attended to lightener their skin directly or used white powder on their skin to look more uh, aristocratic. A variety of products were used including white lead, paint, as if the toxic lead was not bad enough and naturally also contained arsenic. For example, records of men wearing makeup date as far back as 3000 before Christ in China and Japan. They used natural ingredients to concoct nail pain, which was indicate of status in society. Men and women also would wear eyeliner around their entire eye in elaborate cat patterns and they also wore pigment on their cheeks. From 4000 before Christ uh, to the 18th century, men wore makeup daily. This all changed when Queen Victoria I associated makeup with the devil. Religion began to permeate world cultures and therefore definitions of masculinity became less broad and more narrow. By the 20th century, makeup was seen as women's only cosmetic. Aprendiendo el contexto histórico para el género y la ropa, me ayudó a encontrar mi propio entendimiento. Para mí, la ropa es ropa, es tela, de distintas formas. El cambio de género solo depende del siglo, la cultura, la sociedad, las normas de ese entonces. Y aún así, siempre hay gente que va en contra de eso. Yo, corrientemente, quizás sea fuera normal, pero los romanos se fueron a batallas con falditas de cuero, por ejemplo. Mi experiencia empezó con un simple crop top de mangas largas, luego una falda más... Luego con esta falda, y luego esta falda, luego estas, y por fin uh, crop tops de mangas cortas y un vestido. Pero, como dije, yo solo estoy mostrando mi entendimiento de algo que hubiese sido aceptado quizás antes. ¿Cuál es la diferencia entre la silueta de un vestido y una túnica, por ejemplo? Yo me acepto a mí mismo y hubiese sido aceptado quizás en otro siglo, así que poco a poco espero que yo y otras personas como yo, se acepten también. Pues los colores y los significados que les damos varían dependiendo del tiempo y el lugar. Por ejemplo, el color que generalmente asociamos con el luto en el imaginario occidental es el negro, pero esto es diferente en Japón, China o en la India, donde se asocia con el color blanco. Uh, por ejemplo, en Sudáfrica, el rojo es el color de luto. El azul, digamos, y el violeta son colores particulares que, si consideramos sus matices, son también usados como un color de luto en Siria y en Tailandia, respectivamente. A century ago, uh, the colors with which they dress boys and girls were not as differentiated as we currently relate to them. And in 1919, uh, something that marked the new trend will be an article claiming that the generally uh, accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. Speaking of marketing strategies that involved a noticeable gender differentiation by color, here's the psychology behind this choice. Pink was related to, uh, to the strength of red and determination, and blue was considered like a delicate color that reminded the sky and daylight. As the author Ricky Wilkins says, gender is a cultural construct, and most cultures will find some way or another to differentiate between males and females. What varies among the cultures is how. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you to Juanic for his help with the research. That's more his area of expertise. And uh, I'll see you next week. Bueno, más bien gracias por invitarme. Uh, y pues siempre feliz de contribuir con tus videos. Así que... Stay tuned! Y nos vemos. Jean-Paul Gaultier. Jean-Paul Gaultier. Resurgence. Resurgere. ¿Qué es la diferencia? No tengo otro ejemplo. Ah. ¿Qué tengo que decir? Ah.